Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today. I'll start, as usual, with an update on some of the key statistics. Um, I can tell you that as at 9 o'clock this morning, there have been 11,654 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 301 since yesterday. A total of 1,809 patients are in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of 61 uh, from yesterday. A total of 110 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected cases of the virus, and that is an increase of one since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 2,659 patients who had tested positive and been admitted to hospital have been able to leave hospital. That is positive news, and I wish all of them well. However, I also have to report that in the last 24 hours, 40 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,515. I stress this every day, but it is important. I never think of these numbers as statistics. They represent individuals whose loss is a source of deep sorrow to many. So once again, I send my deepest condolences to everyone across the country who is grieving. I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. The entire country deeply appreciates everything you are doing for us each and every single day. Now, as I indicated yesterday, I want to use today's briefing to give a progress report on coronavirus testing. Now, I'm going to say more next week about the longer term strategy for testing, and I will set out then how what's called a test, trace and isolate approach will play a part in helping us emerge gradually from lockdown. And I'll set out what we're doing to prepare for such an approach. Today, though, I'm going to look at where we are now and report progress on two separate but obviously closely related matters. Firstly, the laboratory capacity that we now have in Scotland to process tests. And secondly, the number of tests per day that were carried out as of yesterday. Uh, and please, in advance, forgive me for the number of statistics that I am about to cite uh, for you. Uh, and finally, I'll set out the next steps we're going to take to expand testing in this phase of tackling the virus uh, to help our efforts to suppress it, especially in care homes. But let me start with the daily capacity in laboratories to process tests. Now, at the beginning of April, I said that by the end of April, I wanted us to have a testing capacity within our National Health Service labs of 3,500 tests per day. And for context, at the start of the coronavirus outbreak, we had two NHS labs, one in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh, that between them could do 350 tests a day. I can confirm that we now have NHS labs operating in all 14 health board areas. And yesterday we met our target of having the capacity to process 3,500 tests per day. In fact, we exceeded that target. As of now, we have active lab capacity for 4,350 tests a day to be carried out within the National Health Service. And by the end of next week, the capacity within the NHS will increase further to around 6,500 tests per day, and we are aiming to reach 8,000 by the middle of this month. Now, I also promised that we would work to ensure that Scotland benefited from UK-wide efforts to reach capacity of 100,000 tests a day, and we are doing that. The Lighthouse Laboratory, based at Glasgow University, which became operational last week, is one of three Lighthouse centres across the UK. The majority of the samples tested there are taken from the regional drive-through testing centres in Scotland, in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness and Perth, and the new mobile testing sites that are being established, all as part of the UK government network. The Glasgow University Lab has a current testing capacity of 4,000 tests a day, although I should say that will reduce to 2,000 a day for the next four days because they're moving to a new shift system uh, before increasing to 4,000 again from Tuesday. So in summary on testing capacity, uh, between the 4,350 tests that can now be processed in our NHS labs and the 4,000 in the Lighthouse lab, the total normal daily capacity for coronavirus testing in Scotland is now 8,350. 
And with the further projected increases in NHS capacity that I mentioned a moment ago, I expect that to be at least 10,500 by this time next week and 12,000 by the middle of the month. Now, that is a significant increase in capacity, and I pay tribute to all those who have worked so hard to achieve it, both in our NHS Scotland labs and in the UK government uh, testing network. But of course, laboratory capacity is one thing. What matters is the volume of testing we do and the clinical objectives that we set for testing. This can't simply be about chasing numbers. So we're also working, yes, to increase uh, the number of tests that are carried out, uh, but also to extend categories for testing in a way that better equips us to suppress the virus. It's really important to stress that fluctuations in daily demand will mean that we will never perfectly match the number of tests to our capacity for testing. It's also the case that for very good clinical reasons, many people need more than one test. So the number of tests carried out will never equal the number of people tested. But of course, our aim on an ongoing basis is to use as much of our capacity each day as possible. And given that our capacity has now expanded significantly, that means we can further extend eligibility for testing, which I'm going to come on to shortly. But firstly, let me report on the numbers we reached yesterday for tests actually carried out. And there are two categories uh, that I'm going to cover here. Uh, between tests in hospitals, care homes and the community, I can confirm that there were 2,537 NHS tests carried out yesterday. Uh, and in total, since the start of the outbreak, 74,984 NHS tests have been carried out. In addition, uh, 2,124 tests were carried out yesterday at the regional drive-through testing centres. Now, these figures have not previously been included in our daily figures, but they will be from now on, though because this is data coming to us from the UK-wide system, it will be a few more days until we can break it down into positive and negative tests. In total, therefore, I can confirm that 4,661 tests were carried out across Scotland yesterday, um, and that uh, equates to 4,187 people who were tested. The final statistic uh, you'll be glad to hear I want to give you relates to key workers. 22,400 key workers or their family members have now been tested within the NHS system. Over 4,000 of these uh, are in the last week alone. Now, given the increases in capacity we've seen in the past week and to ensure that we are fully utilising that capacity, it's clear that we are now able to extend eligibility for testing further. Uh, so I want now to turn to these next steps. It is important to stress, though, and I've alluded to this already, but I want to emphasise this point, is that this should not simply be an exercise in driving up numbers. Tests, particularly for frail older people, can be invasive and unpleasant. So our decisions about testing must always be clinically driven, and Dr Smith will be able to say more about that uh, if uh, that is helpful later. As we know, tackling the spread of the virus is an urgent priority everywhere, but particularly right now in our care homes. Currently, around 40% of our care homes have cases of the virus within them. And now, we already test care home residents with symptoms, those being admitted to homes and symptomatic care home staff. And I can confirm today that we will now expand that approach further. We now intend to undertake enhanced outbreak investigation in all care homes where there are any cases of the virus. And this will involve testing, subject of course to individuals' consent, all residents and staff, whether or not they have symptoms. In addition, where a care home with an outbreak is part of a group or a chain and staff might still be moving between different homes, we will also carry out urgent testing in any linked homes. We'll also begin sampling uh, testing in care homes where there are no cases. Uh, by definition, this will also include testing residents and staff who are not symptomatic. Now, this is a significant expansion, uh, and that means it's, it's a significant operational task, and uh, we don't underestimate the logistical and the workforce requirements. But now that we have the increasing testing capacity that I've set out today, we will make this happen as swiftly as practicable. And I'm delighted to say that Jill Young, who you will recall is the chief executive of the Louisa Jordan Hospital, has agreed to lead the team tasked with delivery of this, and NHS boards and their partners will put this into effect from next week. 
I'm also able to confirm today an extension of eligibility for testing through the UK-wide booking system and the drive-through and mobile testing centres. As of now, we're expanding eligibility to include all those over the age of 65 with symptoms and their households. And in addition to key workers who are already eligible through the system, anyone, although I stress there shouldn't be many people in this group, uh, who is not a key worker but who is required to leave home to go to work. Uh, we'll take steps over the coming days to increase public awareness of the ability of eligible groups to book tests through the system. Uh, if there is high demand, uh, there may be a need for an online queuing system. And if capacity is insufficient, we will work with the UK government on further expansion. Uh, we also uh, intend to work flexibly between the two testing systems, the system that is part of the UK-wide network and our own NHS system to ensure that we make the most of the total capacity that we have. So in summary, over the past month, we've made significant strides in our testing capacity. Uh, we've not just met the target of uh, capacity for 3,500 tests a day within the NHS, but exceeded it. Uh, that, coupled with our participation in the UK-wide system, means there is current capacity for more than 8,000 tests per day in Scotland. And as I've set out through further NHS work, that will expand further in the week ahead. Over 4,000 tests were carried out yesterday, and now that we have that increased and increasing capacity, we have been able, uh, as you've just heard me do, uh, to announce a further expansion of testing within care homes and also extend uh, those within the general public who can access a test. Now, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, this uh, expansion of testing that I've set out today is separate and distinct from our uh, move to establish a test trace isolate system as part of our approach to changing and hopefully uh, alleviating the lockdown measures while continuing to suppress the virus. As I said, we'll set out more detail on that uh, next week, but I should stress that approach will require us to increase our testing capacity even further uh, than the levels I have been able to report today. Now, in a moment, the Health Secretary is going to set out one final piece of information about testing. Uh, which is very important, and that is our use of antibody testing. Before that, though, I want to end uh, by stressing this. Uh, testing is really important as part of our efforts to tackle this virus. It is important now, and it will uh, be important in the next phase. And the time I've dedicated to it today uh, demonstrates that. But it remains the case that right now, the most important thing we are all doing is staying at home and following the lockdown rules. As I said yesterday, that is making a difference and it is allowing us to start to see some light at the end of the tunnel. But as I also said yesterday, that progress is fragile and if we ease up now, that light could be extinguished. So please, especially as we head into another weekend, please stick with it and thank you again uh, for your compliance and for doing the right thing in the interests of the whole country. Thank you very much for bearing with me through what I know was a, a complex and technical update. I'm going to hand over to the Cabinet Secretary to cover antibody testing and then uh, the three of us, including, of course, the Chief Medical Officer, will take questions as usual. Thank you very much. I want to talk to you about, as the First Minister said, the serology antibody testing programme. It is a further important tool which allows us to monitor the proportion of people exposed to COVID-19 and help tackle its spread across the population. The test indicates if a person has had the infection or not by looking at the antibodies people produce in response to the virus. The test uses blood samples drawn at random from a range of everyday blood testing processes. These are then passed to our NHS lab in Inverness and the threshold of antibodies in the blood sample is detected with the results recorded. These results are then verified and analysed against wider population information to produce population estimates of COVID-19 prevalence. Health Protection Scotland has already been gathering blood samples in anticipation of a fully validated antibody test becoming available. And this is now being operationalised. Approximately 500 residual samples from biochemistry labs submitted from primary care will be tested per week at the Scottish Microbiology Reference Lab Laboratory in Inverness. To achieve a fair representation of the Scottish population, 
the initial samples will be distributed across six participating health boards by and by age group and sex. The six participating boards are Lothian, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Lanarkshire, Tayside, Highland and Grampian. An extra 270 samples are, will also be collected from smaller boards with further expansion into other boards being planned. The samples are then grossed up to derive full population estimates. Health Protection Scotland is using only the tests which are currently validated for use, but they will, of course, look at other tests. To ensure comparability with UK data, we will be using a similar methodology to that of Public Health England. HPS is anticipating that this testing will start on the 6th of May, which is next Wednesday, and will run for at least 16 weeks. What this then gives us is information from the, that testing over that 16 week period, uh, starting from the middle of May and going forward. The serology work uh, provides statistically robust estimates of the share of the population that has developed antibodies, including those who have not reported symptoms or had only experienced mild symptoms. It is important to stress, though, that this is at a population level. We have some way to go before we have an antibody test in place, which can be used on a widespread basis for the clinical testing of individuals. But this testing approach is suitable for surveillance purposes and has been fully verified. It adds to the information already being collected in hospitals about more severe illnesses and, th and through community testing uh, with those who have mild to moderate symptoms. So finally, I'd like to record my thanks to all of those who have been working hard to get us ready to operationalise these tests as soon as they were validated, and that enables us to take another significant step forward in our understanding of what is still a very new virus. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, perhaps the simplest way to understand uh, this is what I just reported to you is a uh, test to diagnose whether somebody has the virus in the here and now. Uh, that's really important for obvious reasons. Uh, what uh, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined in the form of antibody testing is how we start to hopefully build up a picture of the numbers who might have had uh, the virus in the past and whether and to what extent uh, they have immunity as a result of that. So these things are, are separate, but they are both really important as we go into future phases of trying to, to tackle this virus and, and make sure we keep it suppressed. I'm going to now open for questions. Uh, the, the first question today is Glenn Campbell from the BBC. Glenn, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry. First Minister, um, I was asking, are we past the peak of coronavirus, as Boris Johnson was suggesting in his news conference yesterday, and when it comes to testing, we've been talking with a home carer today, working double shifts, visiting more than a dozen different people a day, who says she can't get a test, but would like one to try and give her some peace of mind that she's not spreading the disease if she has it. Should she be eligible for a test? And if not, why not? Well, key, key workers can access tests through the, the booking system and the drive-through centres. And as I said, we're going to you know, take steps to make sure that there is proper awareness uh, of that. Um, and obviously, we're happy to engage uh, with individual groups of workers to make sure that there is an understanding of, of what the current uh, position is. On the first part of your, your, your question, I I've went into some detail about this yesterday. I think we're seeing uh, positive signs of progress against this virus, uh, principally in terms of the, the reduction in the numbers of people we see in intensive care and a stabilisation, although as you've heard today, this still fluctuates of hospital admissions. That tells us that uh, the transmission of the virus has reduced and our estimates of the, the all-important R number suggest that transmission in the community has reduced significantly. I'm always a little bit cautious about talking about being past the peak. Um, which is not to say there is, that means there's a substantive difference to what I'm saying and what the, the Prime Minister said yesterday. I don't think there is. Uh, but the two reasons, I guess, that I'm a little bit cautious are when, when the efforts is to flatten the curve, as, what, as we've been trying to do, 
you know, the, the peak is not necessarily a, a single day or even a, a couple of days. We, we have a, an elongated uh, sort of uh, path of, of this virus. Um, and secondly, while I really want to, to see and report progress, I also think it's really important uh, that the message I was given yesterday, I've repeated again today, doesn't get lost. The progress we've made is really fragile and it would not take very much right now to send it into reverse. So you know, if, if we want to keep making this progress, the most important thing we have to keep doing right now is sticking with the rules. And, and I think, particularly as we go into another weekend, that's the, the message I want people to hear loudly and clearly so that we don't uh, take our foot off the, the gas, think that we're, we're past the danger point, start to ease up, and suddenly we find we're, we're heading into uh, another peak that is maybe a lot higher uh, than the one we, we've just had. So stick with it is, is my main message today. Gregor, do you want to say any more about the peak? And yeah, I mean, I, I think my view on this is that we'll only know that we're past the peak once we're through in, on, the, on the other side, because I think the margins are so small. There's lots of signs of encouraging progress, and I think we've said for a few days that in the data that we've been reporting to you, um, we, we, we should be encouraged by a, a, a lot of those signs as we go along. However, again, I stressed this, I stressed this yesterday, I stressed it the day before, the, the margins are very, very small. And all it would take was subtle shifts in the way that people are behaving for us to, to go back into those kind of exponential growth of the cases that we saw beforehand and, and, and could potentially take us to a, a new higher incidence of infections every day that would create, a, a, if, if you like, a, 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 another peak uh, w w within the system. So I, I'd be very cautious about saying we're through the peak at this stage. There are encouraging signs of a decline in the number of cases, but we can't say any more than that. Doing by, by staying at home within our own households, we're breaking the chains of transmission of the virus. So it's not able to hop from one household to another in the way it would do if we were all going about our normal daily life. So think about it this way. Every time any one of us starts to see one or two people more than we're supposed to uh, from different households, we are, we're, we're creating a bridge, if you like, that that virus can hop across. So that's why we've got to stay separate uh, from each other, uh, and, and stay within our own household groups so that those bridges are not there and the virus can't hop from one to another. And, and that, that is what is allowing us to suppress it right now. But the, the, the more we start to put these bridges together again, the greater the risk that the virus just runs out of control. Kay Nicholson from STV. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, it's been almost seven weeks now since the WHO said we need to test, test, test. Why has it taken so long to extend testing capacity? And secondly, this might be one more for the CMO. How reliable are these tests? We we're hearing a number of reports of false negatives, for example, and some inconclusive tests. Are these tests effective enough at this stage? Um, can I say... On the first question, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Gregor on, on the second part. Um, the WHO, which is an organisation that I think does absolutely tremendous work and have had huge respect from it, for it since the days I was health secretary and, and dealing with the swine flu pandemic, but it, it gives advice to uh, all countries at very different stages of development with different capacities and, and different public health uh, infrastructure. Uh, what we have done is build um, an approach that is right for our circumstances and we have uh, taken steps to build capacity of testing that then allows us to expand eligibility for testing and, and that process that you saw from the figures I gave you today the uh, the scale of the progress we've made. I mean, I said it earlier on today, at the start of this outbreak, we could process 350 tests a day between two NHS labs. We've now got 14 NHS labs and we can do within them right now, over 4,000 tests a day. That process is not finished. Uh, we, we need to continue to build it, particularly as we go into the next phase, which involves test, trace and isolate. And as I said, I'll say more about that next week. So that's the approach we have been taking. Uh, but of course, how we are breaking the transmission of this virus is through what all of us are doing in terms of, of, of lockdown. Um, I'll hand over to Gregor about reliability. One comment I've always uh, made and stressed here is that uh, we, we know the test is not necessarily as reliable in people who don't have symptoms as it is in people who have symptoms, but I, I think we're pretty confident about its reliability in people with symptoms. 
So for any test to be useful for clinicians, it needs to be reliable. You know, it needs to do what it says it's going to do, and that's detect the illness that we're asking the question about. And um, we're very fortunate in this country that the test that we're using uh, has that high degree of reliability. In fact, in the last 24 hours, I've received published data which actually starts to um, uh, give us an estimate of that reliability, and it's very high. So we, we now have data that shows the test is 100% specific to the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. So that's the first bit of good news. And we also know that it's very highly sensitive to that virus as well. And in fact, over 91% sensitivity. Now, these are very high figures for this type of test. And I think we should take great reassurance from that, that the test that we're currently using in this country is, is useful to clinicians in that context. Thank you. Uh, Tim Batchel from ITV Border. Thank you, First Minister. David Mundell is calling for more access to testing in rural parts of southern Scotland. Will you promise to do that? Uh, we are doing that. Uh, we're doing it as uh, part of the NHS network in Scotland. We're also doing it as part of the UK-wide system. So mobile testing units are uh, now starting to operate in uh, different parts of uh, Scotland and, and rural Scotland in particular, and that's uh, with the assistance of the, the, the army, which I'm very grateful uh, for. Uh, but also, you know, I've, I've just said um, that we started with two NHS labs able to process these tests at Glasgow and Edinburgh, so in the central belt of the country, we now have them in every single health board area. Um, and of course, we are always looking for ways in which we can make not just the accessibility of the processing of tests better, but the accessibility of access to tests. So drive-through centres uh, will be useful for uh, some people in particular locations, but mobile testing and hopefully over time, uh, access to more home testing. So you would get a testing kit delivered uh, to your home. That's already been used at, at quite small levels in the UK, but hopefully that will increase in, in the future. So uh, my message to Mr Mundell would be, this is all uh, well in progress in Scotland and will continue to progress in, in the weeks to come. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Given how we're seeing this uh, increasing capacity, are we moving any closer to perhaps routine testing? Uh, and secondly, given that the, the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow is, is, is now being able to process 4,000 tests a day, is there perhaps a greater role for universities across Scotland, given their, their lab capacity, their, their reputation of biomedical science, that they could perhaps play a role in helping to increase the processing capacity? So if, if I can deal with capacity first, so the, the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow University is part of this UK network of Lighthouse Labs, and that's really important. And we then have our NHS uh, labs within the NHS health board areas. I should have said that we are also um, continuing to explore both with uh, other academic institutions, but also commercial, potential commercial uh, organisations, how we can extend capacity further. And as I said earlier, we, we've made, as you have seen today, huge strides in terms of increasing our capacity already. But for Test Trace Isolate, we still have to go further. So these kind of discussions are ongoing and you're right to point them out because they are uh, really important. Um, in terms of what you call routine testing, I'm going to hand over a bit more to Gregor, but I'm going to pick up on something he said there. Tests have to be useful. And one of the things that I, I think is entirely understandable, and it's, it's something both the UK government and the Scottish government have, you know, have been responding to with the end of April targets, numbers are important. And, and they are important particularly when it comes to capacity, because if you don't have the capacity to process the test, then you, you can't do them. But particularly when it comes to people who are tested and the number of tests that you actually do, that really has to be clinically driven. What is it we're trying to get from the testing? And is the use of testing in certain circumstances reliable? Now, we are now testing people who don't have symptoms in a way that we weren't before as the evidence around asymptomatic cases of the virus uh, develops. But we, we're still not sure that the test is as reliable in those cases as it is the, with the figures that Gregor's just given you for symptomatic cases. It's also, as I said, the, the test can be unpleasant and invasive, and particularly for very frail older people, there presumably has to be some clinical judgment about whether that is a, an appropriate and a necessary thing to do. So I think it's really important as we extend the categories for testing that, yes, volumes are important and volumes become 
perhaps more important when we begin to test trace isolate, but that these are clinically driven uh, decisions. And, and that's why I would say perhaps less of a focus on tests done on numbers, or at least not just a focus on numbers, but a focus on the categories and the purposes and the objectives of testing is more important in the weeks ahead than perhaps uh, there has been the focus on in the last few weeks. Gregor. I, I've got to be honest, I've never been a fan of the term routine testing. Uh, and, and the reason for that is I think that there's, a, there's both a moral and an ethical obligation on clinicians if they're going to ask someone to undergo a test that there's a very good clinical question that we are going to answer by by doing that test. And you heard the First Minister say this this is not a test that we should <laughs> take lightly. It's, um, it's, it's quite an unpleasant test to, to, to receive. It's um, uh, quite invasive in that sense, and, and particularly for some older people, and particularly for some people with um, cognitive um, uh, diseases, then, then it can be quite difficult to understand and provide an adequate degree of consent to undergo that test. So all these considerations have got to be taken. Um, uh, together. That's why I think it's really important that, that as we are expanding testing that it answers those clinical questions that we are seeking to answer. And in the announcement that the First Minister made today about how we pursue this enhanced degree of testing and outbreak control within um, uh, care homes, um, that, that's very much been led by our directors of public health who have come together and been able to uh, develop what I think are very lucid and sensible proposals for how we um, deploy testing in a, a different way. This, this goes beyond what's normally expected in any kind of standard outbreak control uh, scenario. And instead, what they are doing and suggesting with this testing is that there is clinical justification in order to, to, to do these additional tests to make sure that we are tracking and tracing any possible chains of transmission beyond those cases that are known. Jack Foster from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, Scottish Care, who represent independent social care services in Scotland, have told us they're concerned after hearing of instances where new residents had been admitted to care homes without being tested for COVID-19 beforehand. Uh, just today, obviously, we heard of another death in a Scottish care home, a member of staff at Winford Locks in Glasgow. And obviously, we know that care homes have been particularly badly hit since this outbreak began. What is the government's position on this? And does the expansion in testing that you've announced today include when a new resident is introduced into a care home, given obviously the um, potential damage that could be done if, if a, someone who tests positive does come in? We're already expecting new admissions to care homes to be tested, uh, but also isolated when they go into care homes so that there is a, a double protection there or, or a protection while somebody is waiting uh, for a test result. Uh, Jean, do you want to say more about that? Yeah, so uh, as the First Minister said, we, we have already introduced and said that uh, all new admissions to care homes uh, should be tested except where they are a discharge from hospital, where they've been in hospital for COVID-19, in which instance they would need to have given two negative tests before that discharge. But any other admission to care homes should be tested. But what care homes should be doing, and, and this is clear, is the person who is admitted uh, should be uh, in isolation for 14 days. We, we're all familiar with that 14-day number uh, because that allows, if the test came back negative, uh, even so, that allows uh, a, a safe period to see if the individual does develop symptoms. But they should be getting tested uh, in the care home on admission and then isolated for those 14 days so that we can uh, see whether or not symptoms of COVID-19 develop, even if the test has come back negative. That is the right way to proceed. That guidance is there, it's very clear, and its rationale is very clear. And what I'd say is that, as I've said many times, I speak to Scottish Care every single week. I'm due to speak to Donald this afternoon. I know our senior officials spoke to him this morning. Uh, so if there are instances of that, then we need to be told because what we then do is act to resolve any particular glitches that might be in the system rather than assume that the glitch means that none of the system is working. It is working. Thank you. Neil Perrin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. If I can just go back to something you mentioned earlier, the expansion of testing to uh, moving between linked care homes, 
Uh, has that been an area of concern up until now that staff may have unwittingly been perhaps been spreading the virus between homes? And are there any similar concerns about the use of agency and bank staff in nursing homes, uh, perhaps moving between institutions? I'll ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary to say uh, a bit more about banking agency uh, and then perhaps Gregor on the, the more general point. Um, but what, what we're trying to do, it goes back to a point I made earlier about breaking any potential uh, chains of transmission for this and obviously a, a staff member going from one home to another is a potential chain uh, where the virus can transmit which is why it's important that we are, are looking at this in terms of uh, linked homes not just homes in isolation some homes will exist in in isolation if they are standalone but as we know many care home providers have many uh, different homes and it's important we see it in that context Jean. so if we go back to what the first minister said uh, earlier about the, the idea of this bridge that you don't want to be created because you don't want the virus to be able to cross the bridge. So staff moving from one uh, care home to another risks the creation of that bridge. Now, there, would, there should be, and, and we have taken steps to help ensure this with the uh, care home providers, that there is personal protective equipment and that that is uh, a protection against that bridge being effective. But the most effective way of dealing with this is not to create the bridge at all. And so uh, we are clear that the use of staff should not be transferring across like that. But also in terms of the use of bank and agency staff, um, if you uh, use someone from the bank or an agency for Care Home X, they should stay in Care Home X. Um, you can't have them in Care Home X today and then move to, to Y tomorrow. And the way in which we can assist providers is the, that significant number that I've spoken about before of social care experienced staff who have come back from a break or from retirement who are ready uh, and able and willing to uh, help workforce resilience, help make sure that we've got the right workforce in care homes, help providers ensure that they can access that. That works well underway and so Accessing that can help also mean that you do not create that bridge. Yeah, I, mean, I just want to emphasise again, none of this should take away from the fact that, that this needs to be built on the, the absolute foundation principles of effective, infective, infective prevention and control measures within each one of these care homes and, and also the effective um, social distancing measures which are taking place according to the guidance as well. So those are the absolute um, foundations of, of how we begin to reduce the, the, the chances of any of these outbreaks happening. But, but if they do happen, if, if, we, if we are discovering them, it's really, really important that we follow those cases to make sure that any touch points that they have with other vulnerable communities or vulnerable people, uh, that, that we're making sure that we are understanding exactly the impact of that as well. And that's why uh, that this mechanism is in place now. Thank you. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. First Minister, um, do you think that Boris Johnson's message was too upbeat yesterday? Um, and does it risk encouraging people to flout the lockdown, uh, as sources closely have implied on the front page of today's Courier? Um, Look, I, I think it's really important that we are uh, very clear with people about two things, um, and we'll all choose to articulate this in, in different ways. Uh, firstly, as I said yesterday, we are seeing progress here, uh, and it is significant progress, and it's very welcome and positive progress, but it is fragile, and it would be very, very easy right now to send it into reverse. And therefore, if, if we want to make sure we don't do that, we must continue to comply uh, for... Uh, now and obviously we'll see what decisions uh, are reached next week as we come to the review date but as I said yesterday I, I would be surprised if there was a significant change to the current rules uh, as early as next week although all of us are keen to start to get some normality back to businesses for children going to school as quickly as possible so what I'm choosing to say to people and it's not trying to extinguish the, ne the, the positive at all. I am desperate for the, the positive news just as much as everybody is. But it's about how we protect that positive news and build on it. And so if, if we want to do that, then we've got to keep doing the right thing. And as I said yesterday, you know, it's understandable and perhaps on one level not surprising that we're starting to see you know, a slight increase in people on roads and in buses. 
But we've just got to all think about that because if that continues, then we could be standing here next week saying, actually, we've gone back the way and we're looking at longer under down under these lockdown restrictions. So, as I said, and you know, I'll say it again, the light at the end of the tunnel is there, being no doubt about that. But I want I want to keep it there and I want it to get brighter every day. I don't want one day for us to find that it has gone out because we've taken our foot off the pedal too quickly. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that the Chief Medical Officer said in response to Glenn Campbell. Um, he basically said, we, we will only know that we're through through the peak um, once we are out the other side because the margins are so small. Um, with hospital cases and ICU cases going up today, was the Prime Minister's definitive declaration that we are past the peak, was that premature? I had to Gregor on that. What I would say is the, the figures today don't change the fact that we think the trends there are positive. Um, I've, I've always said you'll have daily fluctuations, but they are a reminder that it's fragile and therefore we've got to keep at it. So, so I don't read anything into those day-to-day -day fluctuations, and, 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 and neither should you uh, at all. It's, it's the, it's the longer-term trends which are particularly important. And as we've said, for the last few days, there are very encouraging signs in those long-term trends. But, but, but actually, we need to remain vigilant because, I'll emphasise again, the margins are very, very small, and just subtle changes in the way that we behave, the way that we go about our daily business, just becoming a little bit more relaxed in terms of our approach to social distancing, may see those number of cases start to rise again. So we need to be vigilant, we need to be resolute in our ability to be able to stick with these measures for now. So was Boris Johnson speaking prematurely yesterday to make such a definitive statement that it has passed? I'm, I'm choosing to use my own words and articulate it in my own way, as he is doing. We're, we're, neither of us, we're not robots. We, we choose to articulate things differently. I'm not convinced there is a huge substantive difference in, in what we're saying, um, but I will continue to choose my own words and, and say things in, in my own way. And the, the most important message I want to get across, particularly we're in you know, Friday afternoon, we're going into a weekend. Please, if, if you find yourself going out a bit more than you were a week or two weeks ago, if you find yourself being in contact with more people than you were a week or two weeks ago, then please think very carefully about that and try to pull that back into line. Because remember what we've been talking about, the bridges the virus needs to, to hop across. Make sure you're not creating those. And there is a such a big difference between an R number at just under one and an R number just over one. It's a difference between the virus in decline and the virus exponentially growing again. And that margin is so narrow. So. I keep saying it, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think that's what the Prime Minister was trying to say. It's what I'm trying to say. But it's too early to say that that light is, is not going to be extinguished. So please keep at it. Muir Dickey from the FT. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, would it be right to say that, broadly speaking, you're happy with the way the different governments of the UK have cooperated on the coronavirus crisis? Um, is there any... Are there any changes you think that should be made to the way the governments work together as the pandemic uh, continues? And up to now, has there been any major issue where you have disagreed with the UK government's approach but not been able to do anything about it? Thank you. Well, I'm trying to take within my sphere of responsibility and, and the areas I'm accountable to the people of Scotland, I am trying to take the decisions I think are right for Scotland. Um, I think in the main that continues to, to mean trying to operate on as consistent a four nations basis as possible, but not turning my face away from doing things differently. Um, you know, these things will, will range from, and, and we'll see where we go in the next few weeks. I, I, I'm not standing here predicting differences, but as I've said before, hypothetically, if I thought the UK government was starting to lift these measures too early, particularly given what we've just said about the narrowness of the margins, and clearly I would be concerned about that and be looking to do something different and at a different pace in Scotland. But that, at the moment, is hypothetical. There have been some things at an earlier stage. I'll, I'll come on to, I, I suppose, a, a, an issue that I've spoken about before, but it's worth emphasising in a moment. But in terms of some of the content, you know, I, I felt uh, mass gatherings, we should make our view clear on that when we did, and that was slightly ahead, similarly, but only very marginally on schools. You know, I took a decision this week to make recommendations on face coverings that the UK government didn't do, although I, I heard Boris Johnson being a bit more positive 
about that yesterday. So my, my job is to make the judgments I think are right for Scotland. And, and part of that judgment, given the nature of a virus, is to try to align our actions as much as we can with the other governments across uh, these islands. Um, I suppose, I, I think I went into this in response to a question from Seth Carell um, earlier in the week. And this is not and should not be read as a criticism of SAGE or, or the evidence and, and advice coming out of SAGE. But at a much earlier stage, I felt a need to augment what was coming out of SAGE uh, for two reasons. Firstly, to make sure that that was then being interpreted in a, a Scottish context. So if there were any differences in how the virus was operating, we were alive to that. And secondly, to give me as First Minister uh, the ability to directly interrogate the scientific advice I, I, I was getting. And that's why I chose to sit, establish the CMO advisory group uh, that Professor Andrew Morris chairs now. It's independent, but it gives me a, 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 an ability to deepen my own understanding of the advice and make sure that I'm uh, alive to any nuances of it. So I guess that was a, a significant change we made at an earlier stage, not because uh, we were critical of uh, what was coming out of SAGE, but because we wanted to make sure that that was really tailored to Scottish circumstances. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, on the subject of antibody testing, can I ask what will be the selection process for sampling? Will it be, for example, people who have already um, shown symptoms of having coronavirus and can you also explain the difference in the reliability of the test for community testing and individuals why it's reliable for one and not the other i'll hand over to uh, the cabinet secretary maybe to take the first part of that and then i'll hand over to gregor who's probably the best qualified of the three the only qualified of the three of us to answer uh, the second part of the question with uh, any uh, degree of accuracy the, the serology testing, the antibody testing I talked about at the start, is testing that gives us information at population level. And the way in which that is gathered is, is uh, as I said, from blood samples. They are samples taken routinely for other reasons, but then uh, randomly selected on the basis of age and sex. Uh, and because they are coming now from different parts of the country, I uh, spoke about the boards that are active in that and the ones that will join in, then they, there is also a geographical spread uh, to that as well. And the choice of the factors against which the samples are randomized is uh, worked out on the basis of what would be most reflective of the Scottish population as a whole. Uh, and so that then is, I think that is standard practice when you're looking at population level uh, testing and surveillance for the data that you then need. On the question about uh, why can we do that with this particular test at a population level and what about individual testing, um, that is uh, most definitely for our CMO to answer. Okay, so I'll try and, I'll try and keep this as simple as, as, as possible, but, but if you're trying to test an individual with um, an antibody test, and what you're looking for is you're looking for a specific answer as to whether that individual has antibodies or not. So you need a high degree of sensitivity, confidence that that test will pick up those antibodies in that individual with consistency. And unfortunately, at this stage, the antibody tests that are available don't have that high degree of sensitivity. If you're doing it at a population level, you can afford, because you're testing masses of people and you're, you're trying to get a sense of what's happening across a broader range of people, you can afford for that sensitivity to be relaxed a little bit. And at this moment in time, what we have with these antibody tests is that the sensitivity has reached a level where we can, we, we can say with confidence that that's sufficient to be able to give us a sense of what the antibody prevalence is across that broader, higher number of people in, in a population. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, Adele Merson from the Evening Express. Good afternoon, First Minister. You said there that, you know, with hospital admissions beginning to stabilise, are there any plans yet to restart screening programmes in a bid to prevent deaths further down the line from, say, cancer or heart conditions? Or when might the public expect these programmes to get back up and running? Well, as part of 
uh, our thinking about how we, at the right time, slowly, gradually, carefully come out of uh, the, the current situation, getting uh, the, the hospital and NHS procedures uh, that have been postponed back into operation is a key part of, of that thinking. So that work is underway right now. There's a, a number of different factors that we have to, to take into account there, and, and we'll be saying more about that in, in due course. And obviously the, the screening programmes uh, would, would be part of that consideration. Um, so that, that is work underway. What I would say, and I've, I've said this many times before, is that we are acutely aware of the fact that we're trying to uh, suppress the harm that coronavirus can do to us, but the things we are doing to enable us to suppress that harm are creating other harms. The harm that will come if our NHS is not operating normally for a, a protracted period of time, the harm that comes from economic damage, the harm that comes from people being stuck in their own house and you know, perhaps feeling isolated and their, their mental well-being deteriorating. So these are all uh, different harms that we're having to weigh up and balance so that we reduce the overall harm in the population. And as I said last week, these are not easy, straightforward judgments, but they are all the factors that we are taking into account. And I'd remind people that if you want to understand more about the, the different factors we're taking into account and how we're trying to reach these balanced judgments, the document that we published last week and that is still available on the Scottish Government website is a, a good place to start just to get that uh, insight into the, the process that we are going through. David Ball from the Herald. Thank you, First Minister. Um, given you have expanded testing in care homes, should all new care home arrivals have been tested from the start of the pandemic? And would that have helped prevent the surge in care home deaths and, and the spread that we have seen? Well, as I've said uh, many times, well, about testing, and then I'll, I'll say a, another thing about care homes generally, we have been building the capacity of our testing and, their, and we have been expanding uh, testing as, as that capacity has, has built. And that's what we will continue to do. Uh, as we've said before, and, and this is not a comment meant to downplay the importance of testing, uh, but the most important thing in a care home is the infection prevention and control that is deployed in that care home. And that's why the guidance that was issued to care homes uh, in uh, March was so important and why the most important thing, even with an expansion of testing, is that every care home is implementing rigorously uh, that guidance around isolation and social distancing. And of course, health protection teams with their uh, public health directors now have a, a clinical role in making sure that care homes are doing in the totality of what they should be doing, all the right things to protect their residents. Chris McCall from The Scotsman. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, Boris Johnson yesterday promised that we will not, will not be a period of austerity once lockdown is lifted and people begin to return to work as normal. Can I ask if you think that assessment is realistic and whether the public should be prepared for potentially tough economic times that lie ahead? Uh, I think there are tough economic times that lie ahead um, that we are in right now, and hopefully they will be able to be kept uh, to as short a period as possible and the economy will bounce back. And it's, it's important that we take these decisions carefully because if we are premature in these decisions and the virus runs away from us again, then that will do even more and probably longer lasting damage to the economy. So getting this is not a trade off between health and the economy. This is about getting these decisions right for, for all of that. In terms of how we deal with economic damage, though, is is where you get the decisions about austerity or, or not. And when we last had a, a recession occasioned by the, the financial crash, the decisions that UK governments made, and they were the wrong decisions then, and they would be the wrong decisions now, was to go for an austerity approach to try and to deal with the, the fiscal uh, implications of, of that economic uh, crisis. That should not, in my view, be the approach that is taken now. And you know, clearly the UK government still holds the, the key economic levers there, and we will certainly be uh, pressing them very hard to take a very, very different approach and not to return to austerity economics. So in that respect, I, I welcomed what Boris Johnson said in that regard yesterday, but uh, we need to continue to see uh, that unfold through actual policy. More generally, while, you know, it's, it's difficult to, when we're still in the, the midst of a crisis, to start talking about uh, sort of, uh, positive things to come out of this, we have an opportunity coming out of this to look afresh at some of how uh, the economy works, how our society works, what we really value uh, about uh, 
the economy and society and, and do things differently. And that's something I think there's a huge public appetite for, and it's uh, one that I certainly share. Libby Brooks from The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. If I could just go back to testing. When you first announced the 3,500 a day target at the beginning of April, uh, you described it as proportionately more ambitious than, than the UK. Is that still the case? And is it even an important measure now with the opening of the lighthouse and so on? Um, and if it is, could you explain how you're calculating that proportion? I think from memory at the time we were setting the 3,500 target, which, remember, was for NHS labs, the equivalent in England was 25,000. So at that point, it was uh, proportionately uh, higher than that. I think actually, as we progress this and we're all building capacity and we have not just our NHS lab stream, but the, the streams that the Lighthouse Lab are part of, I think these comparisons probably become at less uh, if they were ever that significant, they become less significant. What's important to me is that we're building the capacity that is right for the testing that we need to do for clinical reasons now and, crucially, as we move into test, trace and isolate. And that's what uh, the Scottish Government will continue to focus on. Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. Um, you talked about the importance of infection controls in care homes and particularly around isolation for patients for 14 days when they've been admitted or show symptoms. How do you do that practically for care home residents who are vulnerable and suffering from conditions such as Alzheimer's? Well, I'll hand over to the, the health secretary, but you've, you've illustrated they're part of the big challenge that care home providers have, because uh, particularly with older people who have dementia and you know very uh, high levels of, of need, these are not easy things to do but they are essential things to do but it is why this is such a challenge for for care homes and why we put the guidance out to, to guide them uh, in making these difficult decisions jean i think I've, I've said before that the guidance that we issued on the 13th of march to care homes which was about ending all communal activity that was socializing that was communal dining uh, and having uh, residents uh, in their rooms in their own rooms and looked after in their own rooms and visiting ending, except uh, for the exemptions, one of which being uh, end of life visiting, was in my opinion necessary, but it felt harsh because I, I understood what the impact of that could be on residents, but also on their families. But it was absolutely essential because it was all about uh, taking precautionary steps to ensure that we could minimize uh, and if possible, break transmission. The subsequent uh, guidance and steps that we've uh, introduced and asked care home providers to put in place uh, is uh, all about protecting those residents in care homes from the transmission. Um, now that has clearly been particularly difficult in particular circumstances. And one of those is residents with dementia who may find it very difficult to understand why uh, things have changed and uh, to understand and accept and become very distressed in those circumstances. So we are taking forward a, uh, additional work to look at what more we can give to care homes by way of um, supplements to our overall dementia strategy across Scotland, which has been recognised as effective and worthwhile, uh, about whether there is more that can be done that assist care homes in that provision, certainly where it is too distressing for an individual resident, for those reasons, to be in their own room for a large part of the day and night. There are mitigating measures that can be taken for short periods that would allow them not to be in that room. But all of that has to be clearly risk assessed against the balance of whether or not that increases the risk of transmission and them contracting the virus. So there's no single thing here, a range of measures, and we continue to want to work with care homes to see what more help we can provide. Thank you. And our last question today is uh, Terry Murden from Daily Business. Good afternoon. Um, I understand uh, papers were served on the government yesterday in relation to the uh, request from a group of businesses for a judicial review to bring the grants policy into line with England. Um, 
the Labour Party has called for the government to save time and the cost of going to court by uh, reconsidering the grants currently on offer. Will you indeed consider doing this? I'm not going to comment about uh, potential legal action for reasons I uh, assume you understand. On the general issue, though, I would make two points. Firstly, uh, we are... Uh, allocating more money uh, to business support than came to the Scottish Government in consequentials. Uh, we got 2.2 billion, we're uh, allocating about 2.3 billion. Uh, we are uh, also tailoring that support to better suit the, the nature of the Scottish economy. So if anybody uh, is saying that we have to match absolutely, obviously we're exceeding in total money, but in the fine detail of that, if if we have to match absolutely uh, what uh, decisions elsewhere uh, have resulted in, then there will be a lot of businesses that are getting support in Scotland right now that will have to lose that support because we are supporting uh, different groups of businesses that are not getting support elsewhere in the UK. So I would, I would simply caution uh, any politician in Scotland to think about that from uh, both perspectives. We have given more support to newly self-employed people. There are uh, groups of businesses at the lower end of the rateable value spectrum that are getting help in Scotland that don't get it in England. We've given more support to uh, interests in the fishing sector, the seafood uh, sector, uh, and we've given more help with, with water rates, for example. We've given help to the bus industry. So if you're saying we've got to mirror exactly, then you'll be taking a lot of support away from businesses that are getting it in Scotland that wouldn't get it in those circumstances. Right, that concludes uh, our questions today. Can I uh, thank uh, Gregor and Jean for joining me today and, and answering uh, questions? Can I also thank, as usual, our sign language interpreter for helping us make these briefings uh, accessible? Thank the journalists, as always, and uh, in particular, thank all of you. Um, I'll end just by, I suppose, repeating a core and really key message. I've been asked a couple of times today uh, whether I agree we're past the peak of this virus. And I've, I've hesitated to use that language. And, and the reason I guess I hesitate to use it is that I think it perhaps sends the message that we're past the danger point. And we're not past the danger point of this virus running out of control yet. We are seeing lots of progress in tackling it. And that is important. That light at the end of the tunnel is there but we'll only keep it there if we keep doing all the things that we're asking uh, people to do. So we're going into a weekend. It gets so much tougher, I know, with every day that passes and particularly at weekends. But I'm asking you again, please make sure you stay at home except for essential purposes. Uh, when you do go out, stay two metres away from other people. Don't meet up with people in other households. If you have symptoms or end in your household as symptoms, isolate completely. If you have to go shopping or on public transport, Think about covering your face with a, a cloth face covering and remember to wash your hands thoroughly uh, and often and make sure you're following cough, sneeze, hygiene. These things remain as important today as they were at the start of this. So please, please stick with it. And the more all of us stick with it now, then the quicker it will be that we get to the point where we are starting to talk about lifting some of these restrictions. So thank you very much indeed. I uh, hope you have as good a weekend as you can in the circumstances. The weekend briefing will be led on Sunday by the Health Secretary and I will see you back here on Monday. Thank you.